So the Biomateriality Research Project is a five-year research project at Humboldt University in Berlin. We're a team of eight researchers ranging from um, master's students to postdocs, and we're working on transformations in society-nature relations as they pertain to the bioeconomy. The bioeconomy is a political project claiming to transform the material and the energetic basis of the economy from fossil to biogenic resources. And our research um, is characterized by focusing on the materiality of living nature and its valorization through high technologies. Our work is both conceptual and empirical um, in order to answer how production, reproduction, and politics are shaping, but are also shaped by the bioeconomy. And as part of the research project, we initiated this public lecture series, um, of which, as Anna said before, this is the first event. The title of the lecture series, once again, is High Tech Valorization of Nature, Work, Reproduction, Technology and Politics, and Green Capitalist Projects. And this is a series that will run through 2022 and 2023 and host guests from a wide range of scholarship um, both in the global north and south. And you can find more information about the public lecture series on our website, which is biomaterialities.de. And yeah, that being said, I'll hand it over to Johannes to introduce our first guest, who is Aaron Benena. Okay, thank you very much, Miriam. Um, so I will try to be short, or I will be short, um, and I'm happy to introduce our main uh, speaker, Aaron Benenov, who is currently a researcher at the Humboldt University of Berlin and an academic coordinator of the research re unit reallocation for the Excellence Cluster Script Contestation of the Liberal Script. Um, and in August, uh, we'll begin a new position as an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at Syracuse University, where he will also serve as one of the core faculty members at the university's Autonomous Systems Policy Institute. And that is probably the reason why you are all here, because uh, you know him through his excellent work in this lovely book here, Automation and the Future of Work, which appeared with Verso in 2020 and was published uh, for those from Germany um, in the fall last year in the Edition Surkamp as Automatisierung und die Zukunft der Arbeit. So um, without further ado, let me hand over to Aaron and uh, we're very glad to have you here with us. Great, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm going to just go through presentation about some of the themes of my work. And um, I'm gonna to try to introduce some materials here that will be, I hope, useful for a conversation about green capitalist projects and maybe alternatives to, um, to that, to green capitalism. Um, but I'm hoping a lot of that will come out in the discussion. I have done some work on those topics, but um, the presentation I'm gonna give is, you know, still largely drawn from uh, the book. So, okay, here we go. So the, the starting point of the work that I've done on automation and the high-tech economy has been the rise of, the, of what I call an automation discourse or a renewal of this discourse because there have been periods in the past where people have gotten really excited like they are today about a coming wave of automation. And just to put it very simply, Automation theorists claim that we're living in an age of accelerating technological change, which is going to bring about the end of work as we know it. Uh, I went through so many different materials from newspapers and magazines and books and uh, journal articles, and I tried to piece together from this kind of discourse what I take to be the core propositions of this theory. And what I think is very interesting about it is that um, you really see this across the political spectrum. You have people on the left, the far left, the center, the right, even the far right talking about these kinds of, um, of uh, what they see as the new high-tech economy. And they tend to share these same four basic ideas. So the first one is, uh, look around you, they say, workers are already being displaced by ever more advanced machines. The second proposition is that this displacement that we see all around us is a sign that we're already on the verge of achieving a largely or fully automated society. The third proposition is that automation should entail our liberation from toil, but since most people have to work in order to live, that could well turn out to be a nightmare. 
And this proposition is the one that separates these automation theorists from people I think of as techno optimists who tend to see like no problems on the horizon. What distinguishes these automation theorists is that they're social theorists. They think there's a problem here that needs to be resolved. And that leads directly to their fourth proposition that the only way to prevent a nightmare of mass unemployment is to implement a universal basic income and transition to a post-scarcity world. Now, I'm gonna talk about this um, a little bit more at the end of my talk. So it's worth just highlighting here for a moment you know, what this dream is. And it, it has a very long history, at least in this form of automation going back uh, two centuries and really in the 20th century uh, and especially in after World War II, you really see the expansion of this um, idea that with technology, with the kind of automatic uh, or, you know, kind of um, expected and driven changes in technology, we're going to get to this kind of material technological cornucopia when we're, we're just going to have everything we need uh, to meet our needs and, you know, go out into space and discover all kinds of new pleasures and meaning. And this recently was the kind of basis for um, a meme that spread very quickly on the internet and, you know, was theorized by Aaron Bastani, uh, fully automated luxury communism, which sees all of these technologies being turned towards a post-capitalist and kind of brilliant and enjoyable future. Um, and, you know, just to say that this idea, it's not only about our capacity to produce things, or maybe we should say even goods and services. It's also about the possibility or the renewed possibility that artificial intelligence and machine learning present to imagine a kind of digitally planned future in which um, not only do we have everything we need, but computers and artificial intelligence are able to figure out what, that, what it is that we need and how to produce that stuff without any need for politics or kind of you know, discussion or debate. Uh, it all happens rather automatically. Now, what is the evidence that this is actually happening? Well, if you read you know, the high-tech literature, you'll see a lot of talk obviously about advanced industrial robotics as depicted here. This is the now old Tesla production plant in Fremont, California, mostly robotic hands, very few workers. Um, people also talk obviously about, as I mentioned, machine learning and artificial intelligence and point to little applications that seem to portend major changes in the future. Um, now, alongside these technological changes, um, theorists of automation often point to some worrying economic trends. The first one depicted here is so-called jobless recoveries, that after every recession, um, what you see across these uh, lines is like they depict the, the, the loss of jobs at the start of a recession and then how long it takes for the labor market to recover. And in recessions in the early 80s, the early 90s, the early 2000s, and then the 2008 financial crisis, it took longer and longer for the labor market to recover. And so the automation theorists take this as evidence of um, a rising problem of technological unemployment. The other thing that they mention is not just unemployment, but also what we might call underemployment and inequality, that workers are massively disadvantaged in this type of economy. They aren't able to fight for wages increasing in line with productivity. And that opens up this gap uh, between wages and productivity that leads to falling wage shares, rising capital shares, and is a major driver of rising inequality. And it's not just these kind of technological and economic um, indicators people point to. It's also, of course, just like the tenor of the times that we have these huge um, uh, titans of industry like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos, who are clearly, folk, you know, they've, they've kind of decided that the earth is just, you know, going to go to waste because of, uh, um, oh, you know, they've mentioned things like overpopulation, pollution, climate change. And so they're using all of their wealth to kind of fight to put some seeds of humanity on, on Mars. And, and that's, you know, that's sort of the, a, big, a big feature of the culture. So the question is, you know, what, what is going on here? What are we to make of this? What are the links between these technological innovations and labor market trends. Um, in other words, is automation really responsible for the growing difficulties workers face finding 
and holding on to their jobs? That's the big question of um, my book. Uh, and here, you know, just a little bit of technical or not really technical, just a little bit of economic argumentation, and then I'll move on to the social uh, point. But the, the, the first thing to note is that if automation theorists were right, labor productivity would be growing at a rapid pace. And people often misunderstand what this term labor productivity means. They think it measures, you know, the work that actual workers are doing. How much machinery, how much lettuce are we producing per hour of work? Um, it doesn't measure though the actual work of this or that worker. It's a measure of how much is produced in total divided by the number of hours people work. So it's really a measure of, um, you know, it, 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 it's really about the production process as a whole, not what this or that worker does. And the reason why that's important is that if workers were being thrown out of production and replaced by machines, it would seem in the statistics that would show up in the statistics as uh, more and more output per hour. So even if all of the farm workers were being you know, displaced and, and lettuce was being collected by robots, the remaining number of workers would appear in the statistics to becoming ever more productive. But what we see is that, and here I'm focusing on manufacturing because that's a sector where advanced robotics is supposedly making its biggest impact. Um, what you can see here is that from 2010 to 2020, when uh, this discourse around automation was really taking off, labor productivity in manufacturing actually flatlined and even fell a little bit. So instead of seeing this incredible boost to productivity through technology, we actually saw a very flat productivity growth. And that's not just in the manufacturing sector, it's actually been true across the economy as a whole. So in those red boxes, I've just highlighted for the USA, Germany, and Japan, which are the countries that are supposed to be at the forefront of these transformations. These are the most technologically advanced countries, the countries with, you know, who are producing a lot of robots. They don't necessarily have the most robots in production, but they're the major producers. And you see across these countries a dramatic fall off in rates of productivity growth. So instead of this radical technologically induced transformation, speed up and dynamism, we see instead a real slowdown um, in these basic measures of technological dynamism. And it's not just that productivity is falling. Um, you know, here again, highlighted in red, you see the just the economic growth rates for these countries. And you can see that um, from the 1950s down to the present, the economy today, no one with a historical perspective would say that we're living in an age of incredible technological dynamism. We're actually living in a time of historically slow uh, economic growth. And so I use this as the basis in the book to make the argument that in reality, it's not that rates of job destruction are accelerating. It's not that technology is displacing ever more people. It's rather that the pace of job creation is slowing down. It's that the economy is growing so slowly that it isn't creating as many jobs as it used to. And that's making the labor displacement problem much more severe, not because more people are being displaced, but because there's fewer opportunities for those who are displaced. And you know, when we look at this as a whole, this is the process that economists call, have called secular stagnation since the 1950s or here the 1960s, there's just been this really dramatic decline in uh, economic growth rates in the rich um, uh, countries in the OECD and also really across the world. So why is this happening? Why, why is there this slowdown? And why, you know, why is it, um, why do we see it as this incredible dynamism of technology when in fact it's better understood as a real deceleration and slowdown. Uh, well, in the period since the 1970s, we've seen an incredible growth of world trade, really astounding. Um, if you look at exports as a share of total economic production, you know, from 1970 to the early 2000s, they rose from around, you know, 13% of all activity being trade to almost 30% of activity being trade. And economists told us that this was going to generate incredible dynamism and incredible gains from trade because that's the standard economic theory that the more trade there is, the more specialization and the more everyone benefits. And of course, 
According to the economists, this is as true for agricultural and raw material producers and mineral producers as it is for high tech producers in the United States, Germany and Japan. But what we actually saw over that time, and these are statistics from um, uh, the World Trade Organization, so no kind of like, you know, uh, not, not someone you'd expect to be a downer about capitalism. Uh, what we've seen is that precisely in that period of, um, of, you know, rising trade, we've seen a slowdown in the rate of growth of tradable items, especially manufacturing. And you can see there, we can talk about this more later, that agriculture has always seen very low rates of um, output growth or rates of expansion of output, uh, you know, going all the way back to the 1950s. And what's happened since the 1970s, really, is that industry has joined agriculture as a very slow growing sector of the economy. Why has that happened? Well, in my argument, uh, I say that globalization generated a lot more trade redundancies than trade complementarity. So we see this, especially in agriculture. And actually it's a, it's a feature of um, two things. One, the hybridization of crops, which really reduced the, the number of crops that were being traded. And also, um, the replacement of many formerly organic uh, industrial inputs with synthetic oil-based substitutes. So those two trends, um, alongside the industrialization of agriculture, dramatically actually industrialized, made agriculture for a while a major productivity growth um, activity. Uh, and as agriculture became really oversupplied internationally and agricultural prices fell, agricultural and raw material producers saw falling terms of trade, there was this giant push for everyone to try to find a place in manufacturing. And there too, there just weren't enough spots for everyone, especially given um, already ongoing slowdowns in the world market since the 1970s. And the result therefore was that across the whole world, and this is again, as true in agriculture as industry, as productive capacities expanded rapidly worldwide, the result was increasing overcapacity. So there was more and more trading, uh, more and more groups trying to sell on world markets, and it drove down prices and it drove down rates of investment. And that then led to declining rates of growth. And here, you know, I'm focusing on deindustrialization, the, the loss of jobs and in industry, because that's a major focus of my argument. And looking at the way that there are these waves of deindustrialization that have unfolded across the world since the late 60s and early 70s. You see here the UK, Italy, South Korea, um, all deindustrializing, South Africa and Brazil as representatives of formerly newly industrializing countries also deindustrializing. But what you can imagine alongside this is like all of these countries with the exception of the UK also had around 50% or more of their population in agriculture in 1950. And most of these countries had less than 10% of their population in agriculture, sometimes less than 3% by the end of this period. You might think, okay, this must be because all of these jobs are moving to China, but actually even China deindustrialized uh, in part of this period between, you can see there, um, uh, between around 1995 and 2003, uh, China experienced this massive um, deindustrialization in its formerly kind of Maoist industrial area in the northeast of the country. And it wasn't until the early 2000s that the growth of jobs in the Pearl River Delta made up for the loss of jobs in the northeastern Rust Belt. And then China rapidly industrialized. Everyone was paying attention to that. What you won't hear is that since 2013, China's also been deindustrializing. It's joined this kind of global trend. And in fact, according to the United Nations, the entire world has been deindustrializing now for around a decade. Um, and that, alongside this dramatic de agrarianization of the economy, um, is yeah, a major kind of force generating the, the kinds of troubles that I'm about to talk about. So, um, why, why has this, uh, you know, why has globalization, uh, growing over capacity in industry and agriculture um, been associated with this dramatic slowdown in the economy? I'm arguing that nothing has replaced industry or agriculture, though agriculture was never really an engine. What nothing has replaced industry is an engine of growth and especially not the service sector. 
So you hear a lot of talk about a transition from an industrial to a service-based or post-industrial economy. But what you don't hear, even though it's everywhere in the statistics, is that um, this transformation from industrial to post-industrial has been associated with one, a slowdown in productivity growth, and therefore, by implication, a really dramatic slowdown in technological dynamism for the economy as a whole, two, relatedly, um, an economic growth slowdown, and third, a persistently low demand for labor. And I study this not just in the rich countries where there's major problems of you know, precarious work and so on, but really across the world where you see incredible numbers of people uh, locked into informal and um, other forms of substandard work, which I'd be happy to talk about uh, more, but here I'm sort of going to focus a little bit on the positives in a moment. Um, so the result of this uh, process has been low rates of economic growth, high rates of un and underemployment, and more job and income insecurity and rising inequality. So how does this way of conceptualizing the problem affect how we think about solutions and how we think about the kinds of uh, proposals that are on offer by these automation theorists? Well, I mentioned at the start of my talk that um, the automation theorists uh, and their kind of associated acolytes have been uh, proponents of this idea of universal basic income. And they've been promoting this, again, from across the political spectrum. You see in the middle there, um, uh, Philippe van Paris, very famously from the center left, a proponent of UBI. Um, over to the, to the right, you see, you know, um, uh, Nick Cernyshek and Alex Williams inventing the future, which is a radical left proposal for UBI. But don't forget about the book on the left, which is Charles Murray, um, famous for having or infamous for having written the bell curve. He's like one of the most infamous racists in the world. Um, and he also is a major proponent of UBI. And I was surprised reading through all the materials on this topic, how often um, mainstream writers on UBI take Charles Murray's proposals, uh, which are just, you know, full of kind of like, you know, uh, desires for a return to white supremacy and, you know, European imperialism, how often these things enter the mainstream of the discourse. In any case, what I'm trying to say here, based on my research, is that if the automation theorists were right, the main issue that society would confront would be one of distribution. And then this UBI story would make sense. Basically, what they're saying is that all of these new high-tech um, uh, production processes that they're implementing are just dramatically increasing productivity and thus dramatically increasing growth. We have more and more goods and services. And the only problem we face is that people don't have the money to buy those things. And that's why they think you know, this is being associated with inequality and the rise of the billionaire class and so on. But what I'm saying is that the problem goes deeper than that. It's not just a problem of distribution. It's also a problem that has to do with the organization of production. The real problem is that we live in a society where social stability is only achieved through growth. And as the growth engine is winding down, uh, that has given rise to problems with people finding jobs, rising inequality, and so on. Now, um, what's made this situation much worse is that uh, precisely under these conditions of slowing growth, what we've seen is that business people, capitalists, wealthy people, they are not investing in the growth of the economy in the way that they used to. And they're threatening further disinvestment. They're saying, look, the business conditions aren't good. There's just nothing we can do. There's nothing going on right now that would lead us to, um, to invest more in the economy. And in response to that, governments have made a few different moves to try to revive the growth engine. One is that they've spent 50 years imposing austerity on all kinds of social services to try to you know, to reduce the taxes that businesses have to pay and thus to increase their profit rates, try to induce them to invest. Governments have been removing labor and environmental protections and failing to kind of increase the cost of carbon uh, because they are trying to, again, sort of encourage or induce investment on the part of private actors. And third, less remarked on because it's not part of the standard story about neoliberalism, 
um, uh, states have also just been accumulating massive, truly massive debts. They've been taking on massive debts in order to try to induce, again, um, investment from private actors. And so in my view, this is a really important part of the story that during, in the course of the slowdown, the threat of capitalists to disinvest from the economy has become ever more powerful. You know, they continuously say, well, we need a better business environment and governments facing uh, all of these social problems at home are looking for ways to get the growth engine up and running again. Uh, and as long as we remain beholden to these demands on the part of investors to improve the business climate, um, we are seeing just multiplying social costs and social problems. And so the question is, how do we turn the tide, you know? And maybe here it would be a good place to talk about or start thinking about green growth, especially as a proposed alternative, a way to somehow square the circle uh, and both really revive the economy and meet um, growing social demands for there not to be an environmental catastrophe in the 21st century. Um, I wanna kind of, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, instead of talking about green growth directly, I'm gonna talk about what I think a really better solution would be, a kind of positive account of what we might be able to do. And then I hope that will help shape a conversation both about what I've said so far and about um, green growth as a possibility. So when I started off the talk, I was talking about this idea of post-scarcity for the automation theorists as this kind of technologically driven automated cornucopia where we just have unlimited goods and services with very little or no labor. Um, what I'm interested in is this alternative tradition of post-scarcity that goes all the way back to Thomas More's Utopia but is also picked up by figures as diverse, maybe they're not that diverse, but Karl Marx, you know, um, uh, Peter Kropotkin, W.B. Du Bois. Uh, and they have a vision of post-scarcity that's very different. It's not one in which we can produce an incredible, like beyond our wildest imaginations, everything we need. It's really a vision in which we're able to meet everyone's needs. And that in itself is a dramatic transformation of society. Normally here I go through and I show a bunch of quotations from Thomas More, Marx, W.B. Du Bois, and show this idea that they had, that um, all of them had, that we can organize work differently, reduce the amount of work that everyone has to do, and really open up a space of kind of worry-free existence for humanity, more leisure, more art, and so on. Um, what I want to talk about here are the kind of larger implications of that vision of post-scarcity as a world where we meet people's needs for thinking about a range of kind of environmental and other problems. In order to think about that, we have to think about um, what's going on here as capitalists are being squeezed in terms of their profits and, you know, where they're saying, what, there's not a good, very, very good business environment, we need to improve. Um, conditions and what that's looked like socially. And I guess my, my, my view is that um, capitalist control over the investment function is only possible because so many people are disempowered and excluded from decision making. It's really this social disempowerment that's the condition of organizing society in the way that we have in a capitalist way. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. What I'm trying to say is that in our society, capitalist investment decisions focus really on efficiency in the use of priced resources. And of course, priced is a really important term there. Um, and as a result of that, they generate massive social costs or fail to generate social benefits, which economists call positive and negative externalities. And economists treat this problem really as one of like, how do we you know, how do we find ways to price what's unpriced? And that's how you get these ideas about pricing nature or, you know, ideas that would lead us to kind of like turn nature into a capital good, which can then be economized in the way that capitalism uh, does. But my view, I'm trying to say that in a world where everyone's needs were met, workers and communities and so on would, would necessarily have more power. The fact that they're not worried about their service survival would mean that they would have much more power to shape uh, and reshape the way that production decisions are made. 
And if you just think about it, a world where all of those people had more power is a world in which other issues besides efficiency and the use of price resources to maximize income would have to enter consideration. Um, you know, the example I sometimes give is that like, it might make sense for a factory owner to, you know, move a factory across the world and say, well, this is the most efficient use of our resources. We should, you know, close down this one company town's factory move it abroad and that is going to um, make everyone happier. Well, that, you know, if, if everyone in that town had some more power to shape the way decisions are made, they would say, well, there's a lot of things you're not considering here. The community, you know, the environment, the situation, the workers overseas, all of these other criteria would have to be included in a world where power was more widely shared as a result of everyone's needs being met. And, and this is like a really simple, but, you know, like powerful problem, which is, which is the idea that in capitalism, the idea of trying to price all resources and then to optimize their use. If we have, as capitalists do in a way, this single criterion for thinking about how to organize production, efficiency in the use of priced resources to maximize income, then we can look across the space of production possibilities and we can figure out, you know, what's the organization of production that maximizes this one variable. We'll just call it as if we were believing in neoclassical economics, present welfare, just to denote this idea. Like we could see obviously option three is the one that's gonna maximize this single variable. But if as a society, people had more power and they could bring out other goals besides present welfare, in this neoclassical sense, um, you know, if they could bring out other goals as being important to them, like even just long-term welfare, not just present welfare, but the future of society. And if you started to imagine other goals, like maybe they care about environmental sustainability, they care about how satisfied workers are at work, all of these different goals would, um, they, would they would result in maxima at different options. There would be different options that would be, one option would be best for present welfare, one option would be best for, you know, uh, long-term welfare, one option would be best for state sustainability, one option would be best for workers at work, and they wouldn't all converge. They wouldn't be the same solution. And we'd have to figure out how to choose and how to figure out how to balance these different concerns that we have in society. And so what I'm trying to say is that a world in which, um, people's needs were met and people were more empowered to bring their concerns to the fore in shaping production would require a kind of break with a world in which um, it's possible to reduce everything down to a single value unit or general equivalent. Um, a post-scarcity society, because people would have multiple important concerns, would have to preserve what philosophers call value incommensurability, would have to look at these different goals and um, and include them in the decision making in a way that would mean that there was no longer one objective or economically best way uh, to organize society. There's no technical or economic optimum. So choices have to be made in a different way. Once you get rid of this idea that it's possible to optimize society, you have to find a different way to choose among the available options. And that, and especially in a society where people are more empowered, you need to have a democratic procedure that allows you to choose among the options, given that there's no single best option for all the criteria that you care about. And here, my thinking about this is really shaped by this incredible Jewish-Austrian polymathic genius, Otto Neurath, who's also an important graphic designer and philosopher of science. Um, he was thinking about what comes after capitalism in precisely this way. He had this kind of two-step procedure where you would use the technical know-how and knowledges of various kinds that people have to come up with options for production. But you'd recognize that because we have all of these different criteria, environmental sustainability, efficiency of production, worker satisfaction, community you know, integration, and so on, we would have to weigh our different options and deliberate about them and then choose one of them to move forward. And there's ways to think about what this would look like in the present, and I can't obviously go into that in much detail, but, you know, a world in which 
production decisions were no longer shaped by the kind of imperatives of capitalism uh, would be one in which at the workplace levels, workers might look for benefits across all of these different criteria, not just looking for ways to make more efficient use of resources or priced resources, but to improve efficiency, sustainability, their own satisfaction at work, and on that basis to kind of come up with a set of um, proposals about how they think their work could be improved. And you could imagine investment boards that are kind of like staffed by not, not like technocratically or bureaucratically, but democratically elected bodies for the different sectors of society with members drawn from workers in a given industry, as well as community members and different kinds of relevant associations that would evaluate these requests and kind of approve or deny them in an effort to make balanced improvements to society that take into account all the different dimensions of human happiness. And that's the kind of basis on which I think today we could imagine um, a kind of different post-scarcity society, one that would be based on reconstructing society to ensure that people feel secure and being able to meet their many-sided needs while recognizing that what counts as a need is always a political question. It's not just a technical or biological question. And that would be the basis as those post-scarcity theorists I mentioned, like W.B. Du Bois and Kropotkin and Marx suggested for opening up and enlarging the space of freedom by setting aside resources too for individuals and associations for use. So I'm trying to present like a kind of alternative to um, green growth there that's grounded in the kind of post-scarcity framework I'm developing. But I know I didn't talk about that so much specifically. So I'm hoping that in the conversation we can um, we can have that wider conversation. So I hope I hope that the research I've done is still you know is is relevant or can be made relevant to the kinds of work that you all are doing in your uh, research group. So thanks so much for listening to me. Thanks so much, Erin, for sharing with us uh, your research, and it's definitely not only relevant to what we are researching in the biomaterialities research group, but definitely these are topics for the century, and we're really thankful for your contribution to that. And also, thank you very much for doing such a great job for not only uh, presenting those um, very complicated, <laughs> but um, uh, very understandable historical facts and facets, but also for taking us to the future and showing us the way how we could maybe um, escape some of those um, technocratic fantasies that are really um, shaping the politics of the bioeconomy today. So that was very uh, worthy for us, I'd say. Thanks very much. Great, so, thanks. Yeah, totally. Um, so now we would like to um, deepen a bit more the conversation between those green topics that we're researching on and, and what you just presented. And we will do so by um, first uh, hearing about Miriam's remarks, question, comments, and then about the ones from Johannes. And this will hopefully um, open up some more topics that we can discuss about. And so I'm handing over to Miriam. Miriam, what, what do you think or what are your reactions? to what Aaron said. Well, um, I'd like to react by way of actually building, trying to build a bridge between your analysis in the book on the topic of work and automation and our particular area, which as I said, is the bioeconomy. So I said in the out, it is really one of several of these uh, political projects to further integrate living nature into the economy. And the emphasis on living nature is important. Um, we're not dealing here with, uh, you know, fossil extraction. Miriam, are you still there? That's too bad. She she ah. said <laughs> maybe her video would collapse, but it's collapsing right in this minute. Let's let's see whether she comes back and can start again. Miriam, can you hear us? It seems like she dropped out entirely. 
So we will have to work with what we have, which is Johannes. <laughs> yeah. And as long as we um, wait for Miriam to uh, join us again, I think Aaron, if you like to switch on your video again, it's safe ah. to do so. All right. So okay. hi. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome um, back. I have some some more concrete questions than Miriam. So the idea was that she would like provide the more general segue. Oh, she's oh, back. and there she is. <laughs> do you want to try again without the video, maybe? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll try again without the video. And if that doesn't work, then Johannes, we can just jump over to, to yours. Sorry okay. about that. Let's try okay. let me turn off my video. Okay, so let's try again. Okay, so what I was trying to say is that I, I'd just like to create a bridge between our your analysis on work and automation in our area, which is the bioeconomy. And I was saying that the bioeconomy is one of several political projects to further integrate living nature into the economy and that this emphasis on living nature is actually important. So we're not talking about mining or we're not talking about fossil extraction, um, but in fact, the discourse is really about substituting such fossil activities through bio-based uh, inputs in both terms of energy and materials. And more recently, this discourse has been, uh, you know, more uh, moderate, let's say, and they're, they're mostly talking about the use of biological processes. Um, and in this general area of the bioeconomy, we definitely do see some examples of automation in the sense of the automation discourse that you deal with uh, in your book, which is in the sense of displacing or even replacing human labor. And an example of this might be um, all the different kinds of smart uh, machines and, and robots that, that we see in agriculture and forestry. But the point that I wanted to make is that it's also very often the case that automation is actually generating work in the first place. And the reason for this is that automation in conjunction with other technologies such as sensors, such as imaging tools, measuring tools of all kinds are really creating access to um, to areas of nature, dimensions of nature that were not necessarily accessible or manipulable in terms of production. So for example, without uh, remote sensors and imaging technology, um, we wouldn't really be having the kind of markets for carbon uh, within the area of forestry or biodiversity um, that we would have, be, that, that we have nowadays because uh, without these sensors, you wouldn't really be able to grasp uh, and measure and quantify nature in that sense. Um, another example might be um, automation processes in gene sequencing. Uh, it's not the case that we have, a, we have a, uh, an industry for gene sequencing now, um, or rather it's not the case in the past that we had you know, armies of people doing gene sequencing in the labs and there was an industry, but it's really only been the case that since it is uh, something that is automatable that uh, we now have uh, an industry that has wide range of applications, whether it's in medicine and forensic, or even these you know, heredity tests that people take at home. Um, so the point is that there are many examples in that for understanding the bioeconomy and how it really came about, it's important to note that automation in many instances actually create work and definitely increases the productivity by making living nature accessible. But um, I think a much more difficult question is how is to answer what this productivity means in the macroeconomic terms that you, that you analyze in the book. And that's another story that perhaps uh, we could try to discuss or try to maybe bring together the elements that would let, let us know um, really whether and how this may get valorized in the larger economy. And probably that would also um, mean talking about the economic sectors that comprise the bioeconomy which is a bit difficult to talk about sector-wise and which is often also a political decision, but that's something that, that might be interesting for us to discuss. Um, a second point that I wanted to make is that it's not just the process of automation that is important for understanding how living nature is being integrated into the bioeconomy, but that it's an ensemble of high technologies. And I think this was clear from your talk that you also have these other technologies inside. Um, and we, we take the, the term high technologies, it's a term that we borrow from German uh, philosopher Wolfgang Fritzhau, and we define high technologies as number one, automated processes of various kinds, 
in which secondly, computer systems are central in controlling the process at hand, and third, in generating data about it in a digital form. But beyond the term high tech itself, what is important or interesting us, to us is actually his proposition, Hauck's proposition, that the current phase of capitalism um, that we're in can be understood as a high tech mode of production. And this idea of a high tech mode of production is actually very helpful for us in terms of characterizing society nature relations in the field of the bioeconomy. And this is because on the one hand, um, at the material productive level, acknowledging the dominance of high technologies was really um, touching on the specificity about what is the dominant way in which the materiality of need, living nature is being harnessed for economic purposes. And this is the, just the point that I was making before. These technologies are super important for gaining access to new um, yeah, qualities of nature that can be integrated economically. But on the other hand, um, this idea of a high tech mode of production is also helpful because, because the technologies are so pervasive in terms of other aspects of society nature relations. So whether it be power relations, whether it be how property relations are being reorganized, inequality, um, and not least um, the ideas that we have about nature and our relationship to it. I mean, just to give a short example, it's such a matter of fact way of describing uh, people will talk about the information in cells or the code, the fact that molecules would code for something. I mean, this is just a reflection of how deeply entrenched these technologies uh, become in two society nature relations as a whole. And so from that background, as I read um, your discussion of the automation discourse, I was wondering whether um, maybe framing it or couching it from that perspective of a, actually a high-tech mode of production might cast how you see the automation discourse in a slightly different light. I mean, I'm, I'm aware you write in, in the book and, and you mentioned it just now as well, that the automation discourse is a spontaneous discourse that reappears time and time um, again. Um, in that, that is a recurring topic and that is often uh, related to the anxiety uh, regarding the functioning of the labor market, but I wondered whether looking at automation from this uh, perspective could explain um, why it's such a pervasive um, idea, as you mentioned, from the far right, from the left, in terms of formulating the problems of the day, um, but also in terms of the solutions that are being presented just now. And so, yeah, I'd like to just stop there for now and um, give it over to Johannes. Okay, um, Miriam, let me check in with you uh, real quick. I know that you wanted to bring across uh, three um, main questions or topics. Did you um, tell us about all three right now? No, I, we decided actually, I'll just keep some of the others for the discussion because in, okay. in the interest of time, that's fine. Thank you, Anna. Absolutely. Okay, Johannes, now it's your turn. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. So um, one of the things that's, interesting to me um, about the automation discourse is that it usually begins by acknowledging nature, um, oftentimes climate through climate change. So climate change is a problem and therefore we need to transition into this post-work future. And then it almost immediately forgets about it again. And I'm thinking here of Paul Mason or um, Bastani um, or any number of other, other theorists. So, um, I'm wondering if you if you have more to say, and I think you already touched a little bit about this on our living in with and as part of nature more concretely. And one of the areas that um, is, of course, central to this is food production, because no matter what we decide that we want and need in the future, we will always have to eat. Um, so somebody or some machine always has to produce food. And um, in particular, I'm wondering what your research suggests about work in the agricultural sector. So um, one of the things that is specific about this sector is that living nature has specific qualities that are distinct. Um, so trees and plants grow at certain rates and they're only, you can only speed them up so much this growing. So 
is agriculture, if you look at it economically, is that one of the sectors in which productivity is hard to increase through technolo uh, technology and automation, in your um, estimation? And if so, so, would you say that this limited capacity for increasing profits through technological innovation is a factor that affects labor conditions? And then um, the second aspect that I would like uh, to raise is this idea that um, often surfaces in automation discourse, but which you argue against, um, and you talked about this briefly as well, that uh, technology will in some way or form automatic automatically transition us out of a capitalist market system. And at least if you're a left utopian into some kind of post work, uh, yeah, you called it cornucopia, so so some kind of um, utopian future. Um, one of the contributions to this debate, which I'm sure you're familiar with, um, because you acknowledge him in, in your book, is uh, Jasper Burns's contribution to this. And I'm uh, wondering with Burns whether um, capitalist technologies do make it easier as the utopians think or whether they actually make it harder as Burns seems to suggest to get to a society that is based around democratic needs and democratic interests and in particular I'm uh, wondering if you could maybe um, talk a little bit about this connection that Burns also makes in his two articles um, between the transformation of logistics since uh, or globalization since the 1970s and the relation to agriculture and energy. Because one of the things that he says is we can imagine alternative societies coming up locally, but then they would because everything is so connected and, and that includes agriculture. And that's one of the things that you said, um, this kind of alternative society that could possibly sprout into something bigger will always be in opposition to this larger capitalist uh, surrounding. And that larger capitalist surrounding will be where food is grown that we need. So um, yeah, is, is there a, have you thought about this this question at all, I guess, or or what would would your comments be to this maybe a little bit more concrete uh, idea of a, a different kind of society and uh, food production power relations between the society and the rest of society? All right, Aaron, I think we've handed you quite a difficult task. Like probably you heard uh, a ton of of possible entry points for your answers, and there were at least uh, four um, or two from from Miriam, uh, two and a half from <laughs> from Johannes. And feel free to to pick out what what stands out for you at the moment and start with that. And please don't hurry. We really want to uh, have your answers, and I might come back to some of those aspects. Um, that are the most interesting for us. So great. Go ahead. Thanks so much um, to all three of you actually for um, for these questions. I guess to 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 Miriam and Johannes for the questions and to Anna for organizing it very efficiently. Um, I took notes as quickly as I could on on what you were saying. I know you also sent me the questions, but I was thinking about them as we were talking. I think that um, Miriam, what you were saying about how often the kind of automation story makes it seem like it's just a story of human beings in existing jobs and industries, you know, being replaced by machines. And you're pointing out that actually a lot of these new technologies are also um, creating markets that didn't exist before. And I think that that's really important. And uh, there's, a, there's a distinction that comes out of this kind of Schumpeterian economic literature, sometimes like evolutionary economics, but not only there. Um, they make a distinction between what they call process and product innovation. I don't know if that's already familiar to you, but um, if it's not, I think it's a really useful distinction because they're saying sometimes technologies 
make it possible to do things that people are already doing more efficiently. And sometimes they make it possible to create entirely new categories of products to sell on the market. And I think you're completely right that uh, in the literature on automation, there's too much focus on process innovation and not enough on product innovation. And I think that um, in that sense, what you were saying about how these technologies are opening up new markets is really important. I think that what I'm, the way that it interacts with what I'm saying is that I think that people are always surprised to find out how small these markets still are. I mean, even when they're quite big, you know, they, in the past, during like the high era of industrial production, there were tons of product innovations in industry, just like the number of, you know, you can look at those graphs that like historians of technology draw and you can just see like, wow, you know, the radio, the television, you know, blah, 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 and so on and so on. Um, but th those at least came of age during an era when like there was sustained growth and those new products that were being created, you know, you could just see in the statistics, like it looks like a straight, you know, an incredible exponential growth line. In reality, it's like one product replacing another, you know, all through these chains of production. And um, that's just not happening the same way now. So I think that that macro story is really important. It's like, yeah, there's definitely new product innovations happening. It's not like the stream of those innovations has stopped. But what stopped is the way that those innovations could contribute to a radical era of growth. And that's like the big question, why? You know, if you read Mason or some other books that are mentioned, or at least catching on to that question, like why is it that we seem to live in an age where there's a lot of new stuff we can do and yet we're not seeing a lot of growth. And I explain that in terms of this massive overhang and increasing growth of um, many people just working in jobs where you know productivity growth is actually very low. Like just a lot of us are working in you know schools, business services, hospitals, and all these other spaces where you know wherever these big innovations are happening, and maybe productivity is growing quickly in those spaces. It's not generalizing through the economy in a way that it might have in the past. Um, but I think that product process innovation is really important and that it's under under examined in the automation literature. I think the high tech, um, the, the perspective on high tech rather than automation, to me, just I don't know the how literature, but it makes a lot of intuitive sense because in a way, you know, in the book, I was guided by my object, right? I was like kind of attacking these automation theorists. But as you noted, it's just, it's not just automation, right? It's computer technologies, it's biotech stuff, as you were mentioning, it's a whole range of other things. And I, I always think when we, when we talk about these topics about that magazine, Popular Mechanics, you know, just this kind of like, and the kind of sci-fi I was brought up on as a kid, just this kind of positive story about technology that just appeals to so many people and becomes this kind of, you know, there's a way that actually even Hayek talks about this. There's a way that like when people talk about economic issues, they tend to fold them into engineering. Like they want to explain everything economic as if it were merely a technical or engineering problem. And it's a way of, um, it's a way of making the social questions evaporate, you know? It's a way of hiding the social and economic character of the problem to turn it into an engineering problem. And there've been, you know, there's like the term technocrat, maybe you know, comes from these uh, followers of Thorstein Veblen, the, the amazing American economist who wrote a whole book about business enterprise saying that like the engineer should rule society because these economists and you know, business people are screwing it up. And the technocrats was like a, a movement in the 20s of people who were saying we should have engineering run society. And, you know, it fell apart really quickly. And that's why technocrat is like a term of um, a disparaging concept uh, because of the immediate internal squabbling and dissolution of this technocratic movement. But that early history, I think, is really important for the kinds of things that you're talking about both the dream of technocracy and the way that whenever it comes, <laughs> you know, it just, it's not possible to evacuate um, those kinds of economic and social questions. Um, 
I would just note as well, you know, when I talk about the automation discourse, I think it's really important to remember that there are a lot of ways that people frame these issues like Malthusianism, anti-Semitism. You know, I focus on the automation stuff and the high tech stuff in part because I think there are positive potentials there. Whereas I think a lot of the other discursive explanations for what's wrong with society have no utopian kernel. You know, I think there's a problematic utopian kernel on the high tech stuff. Uh, which I, you know, focus on in this project, not in all my work, but um, I think it's important to note that there's a lot of explanations for what's going on in the world that are really dark and very popular. Um, so I think that that's, those are at least my initial thoughts about those first two, the, the questions you raised, Miriam. I think we could talk about that for a really long time, I'm trying to contain myself. I tend to go on sometimes too long. Um, on the <clears throat> on on the issues Johannes raised, I think that um, <clears throat> I note that too, and I think I don't say it enough in my book, but I note it. I noted it as well. Like all these people, they talk about climate change often in a list of problems. Like they don't even really focus on it, and then it just disappears. And you have to assume that what they're thinking is like something like this: like <clears throat> we get artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence invents nuclear fusion. And then, you know, we have limitless carbon capture technology, something like they don't even lay out what the sequence is that they're imagining, but they somehow imagine that just purely by like technological leap that we overcome all of the problems of our relationship uh, with nature. And I'll just point out that, you know, in my view, there's two roads for ecological economics to go down or has gone down. And um, I think one of them is really problematic. Uh, it's the view that tries to create either internalized nature as capital, like to think of nature as a priced good, or to find an alternative value metric like energy use to build an alternative economics around a, a different singular value. Um, the tradition in ecological economics that I'm interested in comes from Otto Neurath, who I mentioned, a very important understudied ecological economist, William Capp, who theorized the concept of social cost, which I think is a really important concept, and, um, and the followers from that tradition, which includes um, Martinez Allier, uh, you know, on economic valuation, and the person who influenced me a lot, John O'Neill. So I think all of that's really important. And I think that if you think about these ecological questions, there's a way into thinking about what I'm calling post-scarcity that's very different from the way that these technological cornucopians talk about it. And I'd be happy to talk about that more, but you know, in my view, it involves recognizing the need for multiple criteria of production with no possibility of reducing them to a common metric. And that meaning that we need a democratic procedure to choose among their options. And that being true at the level of the workplace and society as a whole. Um, and that's a very difficult problem that like Neurath and Cap couldn't solve. And I think maybe we can solve it today. But anyway, that's my utopian hope. Um, on food production and kind of the more in capitalism question that you asked, uh, I think that it's really important to note that agriculture was for like three centuries a real laggard in capitalism for the reasons you specified that you know nature had its own growth cycles also think about a factory a factory is a perfect place to produce goods a field is not <laughs> fields that are really hard to work with compared to factories and that really held back technology and agriculture for a long time but that was only until the 1940s when it became possible to create more advanced forms of mechanized and motorized farming equipment um, to hybridize uh, uh, crops and produce more capitalist crops and to generate, as I mentioned, like synthetics to replace um, natural industrial products. All of those things made for this incredible boom that's sometimes called green agriculture, green, you know, the green revolution. It's obviously better thought of as the industrialization of agriculture. And it is huge and it affected the whole world, especially in the 60s and 70s when they started hybridizing all of these tropical crops. 
And so um, what we see actually is that agricultural productivity picked up massively, also in mining, which is really important as well, in the later, in the 80s and 90s, massive increase in productivity in those fields, but very limited growth of demand in agriculture especially. So it, it's not that productivity was lagging anymore from the 50s onward. It's that, um, it's that the demand for agricultural goods just wasn't growing. And what that meant was that, you know, massive competition, price declines, all these things that the dependistas talked about were true from the 1950s onward. Massive terms of trade turning against agriculture. That meant that countries producing raw materials had to produce more and more to implement, import the same number of industrial goods. Um, and, you know, we could talk about that more. It's happening again right now, but it's like um, agriculture tends to go through these like, it's really interesting. I mean, I'd be happy to share a lot of the kind of economic articles. They're not all hard to read about these huge cycles because one of the features, I don't know, sorry, I'll talk about this too long. I'll just say one more thing. Um, one of the remaining features of agriculture is that it takes a long time for capacity to come online. So if the apple, if apples are suddenly growing because someone invented the Honeycrisp apple and everyone wants to eat Honeycrisp apples, if other producers want to produce Honeycrisp apples, it takes 10 or even 15 years for them to bring their orchards online. And so what you see in agriculture is these like dramatic boom bust cycles where prices rise and it takes a long time for the new capacity to come online. And then it's so much capacity that the price collapses for decades. And that happens across agriculture again and again. You see these massive commodity boom bust cycles. And that has incredibly negative effect on workers, uh, obviously, because they're the fact of high productivity, massive price prep, you know, downward price pressure means that um, agricultural producers are just, you know, pushing as hard as possible on wages. And it's one of the most informal and undocumented, you know, all of the kinds of bad things, whether you're in Europe or North America or around the world in agriculture that I think is really important to um, think about. As far as like the international questions, I think that's really fascinating. And I, I don't know, I think international trade and international kind of like, um, you know, organization, obviously any future account has to be about climate change, international production, and I think also reparations all at once. And so it's a really difficult conversation. I don't, I don't have my views worked out on it. So I'm going to like let that one hang. Also, I won't, if I start now, I'll just end up talking for like half an hour because I won't know exactly what to say. Okay. So we can keep talking about that, but I'm just going to stop there for now and see what you want to do next. Okay, good. We can always come back to that and probably it will come up again. So um, now is the time for um, more questions from Johannes and Miriam, but also from everyone who is um, attending our session today. So feel free to raise your hand and um, ask a question or um, just say a comment, whatever you like. Um, or you can also use the chat function, of course, and I will keep an eye on that and moderate the chat. And while you uh, think about things <laughs> to say or ask, let me maybe ask uh, Aaron a question because I, re I got really interested when you were mentioning cap and social costs. So I've been thinking about capitalism a lot, like many of us have. And um, when, or if, if I understand you correctly, you would say that technology does not necessarily create social inequality or environmental destruction. But I think we both agree or all of us agree that capitalism does create social inequalities and environmental destruction because the way of the way it organizes production and reproduction and also um, because of the way it employs technology. And so we are faced with this huge problem of trying to minimize social cost, which is, but, but social costs are actually something that is um, built in capitalism because this is the way of how capitalist op operations become um, profitable. So from the automation discourse and also from the utopian um, ideas that you presented, how would you react to the question of social cost or what is your 
hope or where do you see the potential mm. of reducing social costs? Yeah. Yeah, I think that you're totally right. I think, you know, William Katz's work is, is like really incredible on this idea that capitalism uh, and the way it handles production generates cascading social costs. So, you know, you start off with a production process that has some byproducts of like pollution in the area. And then, you know, 10 or 20 years that that factory is enormous and the amount of this byproduct it's producing is incredible and you just throughout society you're generating all of these um, processes that you know there's always something unpriced that these firms can just push uh, the costs onto society but even more than that I also think it's really important to note that there's a range of social benefits that these activities probably could generate you know that are just not uh, there's roads not taken because they're not profitable. There, there would be ways maybe that all different kinds of work processes could be altered, not just to not be environmentally destructive, but to like improve uh, environmental, maybe we'll say the productivity of nature, but in a non-capitalist sense. There's all these different ways that, you know, um, work could be changed to like increase our, you know, social trust in one another or to like make workers field or work, all of things, all of these opportunities that aren't taken. And so I think that it's really, um, it's, it's really interesting that when, you know, if you try to look into the history of externalities as a concept, what you'll find is that there's very little about it until very recently, because until very recently, the assumption is that these things were extremely small. And it's only in the past decade or two, maybe two and a half that economists have been willing to recognize, oh no, we may, and many of them still don't, right? But some of them are willing to recognize, oh no, this was actually a huge issue. And we may have, you know, we may have really, I don't know, made things really bad in an unreparable way. Um, but yeah, I think it's really important to see that, like my idea is to say something like this, in capitalism, all we can do is say to capitalists, hey, pursue your interests, make as much profit as you want, but or as you can, but like we're gonna set guardrails on what you're allowed to do. And you know, states try to set those guardrails, they often don't really know how. Even when the guardrails work, they create many opportunities for um, if you can do regulatory arbitrage and get around the guardrails, you can make a lot of money. And we see that over and over again, like Uber, for example, but throughout society. Um, when the state creates guardrails, capital is incentivized to find ways around them. Uh, that perspective about limiting the damage that companies do, I think there's an alternative. And I started to describe it, but it's, you know, and it's complicated and I'm still thinking about it. There's an alternative world where these workplaces, which are a form of power in society, could be used to just like find multiple benefits. Like instead of limiting their cost, what would it mean to live in a world where like the people who work in a workplace say like, you know, what are ways we could improve our production here that would actually increase econo ecological benefits, you know, ways that would increase worker satisfaction and so on. Like, there's a different model of society that takes all these things that for capital or costs and turns them into benefits for workplaces to pursue. And that's the starting point that I'm working with. It's like, what, what does that world look like? And it, it has, that world doesn't have externalities because it doesn't have a singular focus that's then generating social costs on the outside. We would rather be one in which, yeah, there's these multiple criteria that workplaces are pursuing. I don't know. I, I, be happy to talk about that in more detail, but I think that that is a possibility, and the question is about the social arrangements that would generate that. Yes, absolutely. It would definitely widen the scope of not only businesses but the economic discipline as such. And we should keep talking about this: how to actually do this kind of multi-criteria assessment without falling into the trap of. Uh, equalizing all goals like uh, yeah. the general mainstream sustainability framework does, where, which actually renders those um, goals um, sub uh, substitutable to one another. 
And yeah. of course, we're uh, way beyond that with our thinking. <laughs> so um, I saw some uh, hands raised in the chat. And um, of, of course, uh, feel free um, to raise your hands and use the chat function if you want to. And the first person who I see here is Luisa. She's actually from Luisa Prause, Dr. Luisa Prause is actually from our working group. Please, <laughs> Luisa, unmute it. No, I hope. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, everybody. Uh, thank you, uh, Aaron, for a very, very, very interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I think I, I came out with um, two questions. Um, the one stems from my um, own interest in digitalization of agriculture and labor relations. And what we are seeing there now is like more and more an interest from kind of the um, ecological agricultural people, also like quite the progressive people, is like super big interest in robotics. Precisely like linking up to the idea that like work in agriculture is bad working conditions, very informal, very hard for farmers to like pay the workers decently, a lot of like self-exploitation on the like permaculture people and so on and so forth. Um, so they like really put the hope into like small scale robotics saying that, well, finally, you know, we're getting around this like issue of exploitation. So I was just wondering um, what do you think if this is like uh, an area where robotics could maybe, you know, uh, have a positive contribution on on things. And the second question um, relates a little bit to your uh, more utopian um, focus, uh, which I really liked also, I really enjoyed your images. <laughs> um, and I was wondering, I mean, more from like a political strategy perspective, how do we get from A to B? Because my feeling is in the whole debate, also like in science fiction literature, there is quite a lot of now, you know, like new utopian visions coming out in the last like two, three years. And like the left kind of like try again to like think of like, you know, kind of like ecological utopias. But I find there's like very little like proposition of how to actually get from A to B. You know, like where's like the transformation, the transition perspective as a movement, where would we start, like if we wanted to take up your ideas, where like the starting points to get active. Thank you. Great. Yeah. I mean, I think that the the what you mentioned about digitalization of agriculture is pretty fascinating. And I I have not looked myself into how successful they've been they've been and i'd be curious if you have any thoughts about that because you know i mean one of the things i learned researching this topic is just that like you know companies put out all of these press releases about what they're doing and for the past 10 years too many researchers have believed them you know like about what they say they're doing and it turns out they're never doing what they say, but sometimes they're doing things that are interesting and transformative. And um, yeah, it's like, you know, picking strawberries has always been a huge problem for agriculture, like any delicate fruit, tomato. And, you know, are they finally going to create a tool that can do this without human labor? And that would be massive in terms of its social effects. like. There's so many people who are employed picking strawberries in California and tomatoes. And, you know, if those jobs suddenly became, um, if it became as easy to pick a strawberry as it is to um, pull up a potato, which also used to be really hard, as it is to thresh wheat, you know, with the machine, then that, yeah, again, like in the book, um, I mentioned this idea that what we do see sometimes with technologies are breakthroughs that 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 find an activity that used to be very resistant to productivity growth and it solves the problem of that resistance and brings it up to speed and agriculture would be an area where i can imagine that having huge social consequences another other ones i mentioned just you know are sowing around the world it's like a huge laggard technologically that maybe these new technologies are going to change and obviously certain aspects of assembly like electronics assembly but you know, there the promises have not been met. Like in SoBots and in different kinds of you know electronics assembly, it's just not really happened. Maybe it's because the labor's too cheap. I actually believe it's probably because the technologies aren't good enough. So it'd be good to know whether that's actually happening. You know, um, it's also important to just note that like 
in the last 50 years, people always say, oh, we're going to have these new technologies and they're going to improve workers' conditions. But because of the nature of agriculture, they result in, you know, massively lower prices, huge self-exploitation on the part of workers who don't have access to the technology and farmers and just you know social devastation unless they're accompanied by really different kinds of um what would you call that like uh you know i mean even these have all failed but like ideas about agricultural improvement uh like social programs that are actually trying to help people and not just seeing it as something that can be solved technologically that's the whole history of the green revolution the idea that these are technological, not social problems. Um, but yeah, I'd be curious what you think. But maybe before I ask you that, um, on the political strategy question, I think it's really interesting. Like I, I think that my view, like I'm trying to, I'm trying to be one of those people. I'm like lagging you now. Everyone's coming out with their visions in the last two or three years. Here I am, still plugging away on mine. Um, but I, I think that it's really for me personally trying to figure out what where we're trying to get to does have big implications for how to get there right and i think that i do think in light of the work i'm doing now i would hypothesize that you know it's been very hard for the left to have a strategy because people don't really know where they're going and i think that you know once you know where you're going or at least have a debate about it then you can have a debate about how to get there that's more coherent. And I think it's important to distinguish between things we might be able to do in this world and things we could only do when there's like a rupture with this world. And, you know, to my mind, the big problem I try to talk about in my presentation, my book, is this threat of disinvestment, not just like the capital strike, not just a moment where capital says, hey, I think you're trying to overthrow us. We're just going to shut everything down but really this persistent way that um, business owners and managers and wealthy individuals can just say this all is creating a bad investment climate for us we're going to pull back and you're going to suffer the consequences whether it's the state or workers and so on and it creates massive political pressure but i think in the meantime we can imagine i was very interested in ideas about basic services like the idea especially coming out of the corona crisis that like you know we just need to provide people with better public health and with you know access to housing reconceptualizing climate change as a housing problem an agriculture problem you know it's all these different sectors of society that have to change and saying that these meeting these needs really matters and bringing back the idea that we need to create more security for people but I think that, you know, among those who advocate those things, it's really important to recognize the other side, which is that that will be that will be massively macroeconomically destabilizing socially on the part of capital. And also um, that, uh, you know, once people's needs are met, if that ever happens, people won't like the, there was a problem in the 60s where technocrats thought if we just meet people's needs, they'll be happy. But it turns out when you meet people's needs, they care about all these other things that a technocratic society can't give them. And that's why for me, it's really important to link this idea of an absolute demand to meet people's needs on the one hand, with a demand not just for like democratic control, but for this kind of multi-criterial society that actually has all of these different- Absolutely. Um, concerns coming out those two things have to go together and i think when you look at the soviet union or keynesian technocrats they really didn't weren't able to see that in a way um, okay. but it's also a really hard problem <laughs> okay i'll stop talking <laughs> <laughs> thanks for wrapping uh, up with, with this answer alon and um for the depth thank you also very much for that um, so we will be a bit over time so please bear with us if we take uh, five more minutes and we had another question uh, from the audience. We still have this question from the audience. Marius Bickhardt, please, um, because of the time, please be brief with your uh, comment or question. And Aaron, please be brief with your, with your answer. Yeah, OK, I, I try. So yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, all of you, for organizing this. Um, and thanks, uh, Aaron, for, for your presentation. So I, I had two questions. I tried to, try to be uh, quite quick, because actually, I was wondering um, uh, Aaron, what what would be like your uh, forecast or your estimation on um, the capacity, like of, of like 
green growth capitalism um, to uh, precisely create a new um, growth engine um, in, in, in during like this the coming decade since uh, I mean since a lot of like eco Marxist accounts uh, often stress the the fact like James O'Connor or, or even Jason Moore like stress the fact that um, like there would be the end of cheap nature and uh, the ecological crisis would be um, yeah would be uh, especially an economic crisis like like a, a factor um, pressing on the uh, on the on the profit rate basically and the second question what uh, concerns um, actually the the, uh, the food and industry uh, since I was um, I recently was quite interested in, in this sector because uh, I observed that like the the augmentation of, of industrial lift stock uh, was really uh, really impressive these last decades like in in the 60s there were like something like six billion um, uh, slaughtered industri industrial animals and nowadays the forecasts are, are something like 120 billions in like 2050 and with the pandemic also like we we, we see that this creates a kind of new um, planetary boundary that is um, uh, that, that we go beyond and so I was wondering also like what what uh, what are your your estimations on the evolution of this of this sector thank you okay I'll try to be brief um so those are huge questions that you know are impossible to answer in any length of time. But uh, I think you know I'm I'm obviously skeptical of green growth just because we've now lived through fifty years of cap of state saying like, hey, we're gonna you know we're gonna invest and find our way towards whatever it is. Like you know in the '80s it was a certain thing, in the '90s it was like the new economy, and in the 2000s it was whatever else like using housing, there were all these ideas about getting the engine up and running again that failed. I don't, I don't see states really going the distance to actually like um, uh, um, do what it takes to take so much power away from private actors to make that kind of thing possible. Maybe the existential threat of climate change will push them to do that, but I think it's hard to imagine that happening. I think even if it does happen, um, you know, and that links to your second point, it's just very hard to imagine that um, that you know we can achieve growth and actually reduce carbon emissions at the same time. I think I've been amazed by the kinds of um, you know, the rapid decline in prices of new forms of energy like solar and wind power. I think it's very impressive though those industries are also in big trouble or at least the wind industry is, and that's worth um, talking about. But, you know, it seems pretty clear that there's no path that doesn't involve a radical reduction in air travel, hence a reduction in tourism income, as well as, you know, as you were mentioning, like just a massive reduction in the number of animals, like the whole industry of uh, farm animal slaughter, refrigeration, and so on, like all those things have to change a lot. And it feels to me like the green growth discourse sometimes makes it seem like there won't have to be any sacrifices, that it's somehow possible to achieve this transition without anyone losing anything. And I think that that in itself is a very important sort of tell because what it implies is like, they're trying to say that there's no need for a new social contract. There's no need to kind of say like, well, everyone's gonna to have to make sacrifices. So we're going to have to um, share those. And there's going to have to be a reorganization of society that gives to those who don't have and those who have to make sacrifices. And I just haven't really seen that on the table so far. So I'm skeptical of a lot of what's been said so far. And so far also, you know, those skeptics have been right, I think. There's a lot of boosterism around this in the last year or two that doesn't seem to have worked out. But who knows, maybe now with the Russia-Ukraine war, we're gonna see 
a form of militarized green growth in Europe um, that, you know, has some, that will do something that will change the coordinates within which this conversation is happening. So it just seems like too rapidly changing a phenomenon to exactly be able to predict um, how things are gonna be, gonna work out if we're trying to predict what's actually gonna happen rather than talking about what, um, what we want to happen. I think the global dimensions, which I didn't even mention are really important. It's very hard to imagine green growth generating full employment in Africa, India, China, you know, um, in the way that it's being talked about as a solution in let's say the United States. Um, and that's, that's a really important dimension too. So I'll just, um, I'll, I don't know, I like to end with something positive, but now I just ended really negatively. But you I have somewhere time to think about this because I have announcements to make and you will have the last word. Okay. So if all of you want to um, continue with us this conversation of uh, the future of nature, how it will look like, and how through uh, the work we do, especially in agriculture, um, this future of nature, this future nature will be mediated and what the role of high tech is, in this, then please keep connected to us. We have the Biomaterialities Research Group and we have a website, biomaterialities.de. It's also available in English. And check out um, our public events um, section in there and maybe also our publications if you want to read about our um, research. So there is an upcoming event that I want to point out. It's going to um, happen on April 6th in uh, Europe, this will take place in the afternoon, 2 to 5 p.m. And we will discuss uh, green governance and the bioeconomy, critical perspectives on environmental policy. And we will have great speakers, for example, Marcella Vecchione, who will talk about um, value chains uh, in the Amazon and what green bonds have to do with that. Also, we will have um, Uli Brandt talking about um, contours of um, historical material policy analysis and what this um, means for uh, environmental governments and many more um, speakers such as Maureen Santos on nature-based solutions. So these are all hot topics in uh, critical sustainability research when it is applied to the bioeconomy. So please check it out and join us in these and also future events. So now finally is the time to uh, thank Johannes and Miriam for their great questions, comments, and remarks, and also to Marius and Luisa for additional um, perspectives. And of course, also to Aaron, thanks very much for taking the time to be here with us and also uh, taking this leap with us into the territory of uh, all things green that of course is um, something that you did extra and you did it for us and you were open to the conversation. So we're really thankful for that. And if you want to, please uh, end with <laughs> however positive note you wanted to end. No, I'm just going to say uh, thank you so much to um, Anna, Miriam, and Johannes, and, and the research group for having me. It's really great talking to you. I'm really, I'm just glad to find people here in Berlin where we can talk both about, you know, critical theory, you know, and what's what's the what's the you know the the problems with these kinds of. Uh, um capitalist perspectives on nature and technology but also to consider some possible positive frameworks that we can use to think about it i think that's really you know a unique thing here and it's really great to be able to have that kind of conversation with you all and if you want to reach out individually and talk more about any of this stuff please feel free and as i i mentioned before most of you came on i'm i'm here in berlin um and yeah if you're around definitely drop me a line so thanks again so much for having me. It's mm. great to see you all. Thanks, Aaron. And yes, please keep in touch. I wish all of you a very pleasant evening or day wherever you are. Uh, goodbye. And everyone who wants to say a few more words, just hang in this Zoom room. Otherwise, goodbye to all of you. <laughs>